Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, this is the webinar on cover crops, selection and management. And, and um, this is the fourth presentation in the Soil Health and Organic Farming webinar series brought to you by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from the Clarence Heller Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. We are recording this webinar, and you will be able to find the recording on the eOrganic YouTube channel in one to two weeks. This webinar will last between 45 minutes and an hour, and then we will have 30 minutes for questions. We're expecting quite a large group today, so we may not get to every question, but we'll answer as many as we have time for after the presentation is over. So if you have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. It's easier for me to see them if they're in the Q&A box rather than the chat box on your webinar control panel at any time during the webinar. So I am always glad to welcome back our presenter of this series, Mark Schoenbeck. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic and sustainable agriculture. He is the Research Program Associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and he also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. Diana Jerkins of the Organic Farming Research Foundation also worked on this presentation, and she will be participating in other webinars in this series as a presenter, but she was unable to come today. So I am now going to hand over the screen control to Mark Schoenbeck, and then Mark, when you've got it, you can take control. Okay. Um, so this is a session on uh, cover crops for soil health uh, selection and management. Um, and it's based on a lot of research, a lot of it conducted through the USDA Organic Research and Extension Initiative, and uh, we... Um, uh, Organic Farming Research Foundation did an extensive analysis of that work and then uh, developed more of it into a body of practical information for growers. So I'll just start by uh, quickly covering some basic concepts of how cover crops uh, improve soil health. Uh, next. Um, uh, probably you know, most of you know most of these, but we'll just go over them real quickly. Um, soil health uh, the benefits of cover crops include preventing soil erosion. Uh, they build soil organic matter and feed soil life. Um, any living plant in the soil is feeding soil life through the roots all the time. We'll get to that a little bit more later. Uh, but cover crops are especially effective because um, among annual crops, they're the leaders in biomass production. Um, and uh, they improve soil tilth, they drainage, aeration. Of course, the legumes fix nitrogen. And all cover crops are good at recovering nutrients from the uh, subsoil, preventing leaching, uh, retaining and conserving nutrients for the next crop. And having all that living plant um, activity in the soil will uh, gradually increase the soil's capacity to hold moisture as well as nutrients. So the organic standards, the USDA National Organic Standards, actually require uh, organic growers to use cover crops both as a soil fertility and crop management uh, tool and also as a uh, critical part of the crop rotation. Um, and the crop rotation practice standard requires a rotation that will uh, have these four key functions of um, improving their soil organic matter content or overall soil health, uh, providing pest, pest management, uh, managing nutrients, preventing both deficiencies and excesses, and, and of course, uh, providing erosion control. Next. So uh, the living plant is both nature's primary tool and the farmer's primary tool for building and maintaining soil and for maintaining soil health. And that's because all the time that a plant is photosynthesizing, somewhere between one-tenth and one third of its photosynthetic product goes right down through the roots and out into the soil to feed the soil life. And of course, having the living plant cover is protecting the soil surface. And between that protection and the action of the roots, uh, this is maintaining and rebuilding soil tilth or crumb structure all the time. Uh, tilth is a very dynamic property in and of itself in that it requires the plant roots and the action of the microbes and all of that fresh organic matter coming out of the roots to keep maintaining it. And 
um, as his roots are feeding the soil life, they are also opening and deepening the soil profile. Uh, next. So cover crops, uh, in an annual cropping rotation, we can think of the living plant, uh, both the cover crops and the cash crops, but um, especially the cover crops as the primary tool for building healthy soil, for feeding the soil and maintaining the fertility. Um, now, cash crops do this as well, uh, but you have to debit what you take to market. So if you're growing a root crop, digging the whole thing, bunching it up as, you know, beets and carrots and radishes and take the whole thing to market, you're really just leaving whatever uh, was exuded in the soil. Uh, you get to something like a, a greens or a brassica, you're just taking most of the top of the plant. The root mass goes back into the soil. And as you get into things like uh, grasses, um, uh, grain crops, uh, tree fruits, et cetera, really most of the plant's contributions remain with the soil. Uh, but anyway, so the point here is that um, the cover crop is the found that the, the living plant is the foundation, especially the cover crops, and then uh, compost and manure and uh, also careful tillage and any other soil organic soil management practices, they have a very important supplementary role. Uh, it's been found that um, cover crops plus either compost or manure or a little of both will often build soil health more effectively than either practice alone. And that's because they make different kinds of contributions to the soil biota, uh, both to feeding it and to uh, replenishing uh, organisms, et cetera. And of course, you want to till carefully. Um, you don't have to go to st continue with strict no-till in order to be building soil health, but um, just till only when it's necessary and use the gentlest um, method you can so you're not pulverizing all the wonderful aggregation that the soil biology has created. Next. So this is a concept that I've been reading about uh, in various uh, research publications, sustainable crop intensification. Basically, all that means is you want to increase, on the average, over the course of the rotation, you want to increase biomass production per year you want to maximize the days per year in living cover. You want to maximize the extent, depth, and duration of, of living roots. And the interesting thing is uh, there have been these studies in which there are two different crop rotations that return similar amounts of organic matter to the, uh, in terms of biomass. But the one that built the soil most effectively was the one that maintained that living root growth for a larger percentage of the rotation. For instance, if you had a corn-soy rotation with uh, high biomass cover crops, it actually does better if you then rotate into a year or two of alfalfa or clover or grass clover, um, even if the total biomass is similar, and that's because you're keeping the soil life uh, fed with living roots uh, more of the time. And anytime the soil is covered by either living rats, uh, plants or uh, residue, you will get um, you will greatly reduce erosion. Some important practices, of course, growing high biomass cover crops to the topic of today's uh, talk, adding that perennial sod in the rotation when it's practical, and also when you're growing orchard or vineyard or berry crops, definitely get those alleys into a living plant cover. I mean, right near the young, just establishing crops, you probably will need to prevent living plant cover from competing. You can use some organic mulch. But once you got your trees, your vines established, you really pretty much want that whole uh, floor covered in living cover. Um, in fact, studies have shown that uh, bare fallow management, whether it's either done with tillage or with herbicides, uh, will over time will cut soil organic matter by half compared to um, some form of a managed living cover. It could be mowed or, or um, you know, just managed that way. So here's an example, a typical corn soy rotation. If there's no cover, the corn and the soybean are both four-month crops, so you've got about seven or eight months fallow between. And even in a continuous no-till application, and this is talking conventional agriculture, since in organic ag that would just grow weeds, but the point is that even with continuous no-till, uh, there's these long periods of time where the soil life is not being fed, and if you have a low residue crop like soybeans and you follow it with uh, that fallow, um, you can get severe erosion in one big rainstorm. Next. So a couple of ways to, to um, in, do some crop intensification and improve soil health here is uh, the basic one is just to put a, a 
cover crop and you just plant one species, you'll plant rye ahead of soybeans because soybeans fix their own nitrogen. And then you might plant something like vetch or crimson clover or Austrian pea ahead of the corn because you want all that nitrogen to go into that very heavy feeding crop. You still have some periods of um, soil exposure there. It's going to take a while for the rye to come up after you've um, prepared the seed bed after corn harvest and same with the uh, uh, getting the vetch to come up. So another way, and it's especially important in cooler climates where your growing season is shorter, um, more and more farmers and researchers are interseeding cover crops into the corn and the soy. Uh, do it the corn at about the five leaf stage, the soybean at the about four leaf stage. And then when you harvest, you already have the cover crop seedlings established. So they're not going to grow quickly under the canopy of your cash crop, but at least they'll be established. And as soon as that canopy is removed, mowed off or whatever, um, they're going to grow rapidly in the early fall before it really gets cold and they have to go dormant. Next. So uh, we're looking at the four NRCS principles. Uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service has developed four principles of soil health management and our review of research conducted for organic farms so the Organic Research and Extension Initiative have abundantly validated these four principles. One is just keeping the soil covered. And the best is living plants in most circumstances, uh, although if very cold winters or um, very limited rainfall in semi-arid regions limit how much you can grow in the way of living cover, just keeping residue on the surface is going to at least prevent erosion. So during the winter, uh, most parts of the United States, uh, when it's out of production, uh, planting a winter cover crop is an excellent way to, uh, to get the soil under a living cover. And then if you're in a very hot climate and it's just too hot and um, to really produce in the summer, some areas in the uh, Gulf Coast states can be like this, plant a summer cover crop. There are some that are incredibly heat tolerant. Um, if you have a crop that uh, frost kills, definitely leave that residue in place until you're ready to plant in the spring unless uh, soil conditions or, or moisture problems are such that having the residue there in the spring will seriously delay uh, soil prep and uh, planting. But whenever possible, you want to keep it covered one way or another. One thing I want to point out is that some of the summer cover crops are are very uh, effective at covering the ground for a fairly short um, interval. Like with, if you have a four-week interval that you're going to, like you're taking lettuce out in May, you're not going to plant your summer cucumbers to late June, let's say, you can plant buckwheat. That'll cover the ground in 14 days, and you'll get a decent biomass within that four or five weeks. Um, cow peas are another good one for short intervals, and some of the millets, particularly foxtail and Japanese millets, uh, if you've got a six-week interval, uh, mix some of the millet in with uh, either the buckwheat or the cow pea. Next. Uh, second principle is maximizing living roots in the soil profile. Um, on the left is a um, at a, a field day um, in association with the Southern, cover crop, Southern Region Seri uh, Cover Crop Conference in 2016. And they just grew these um, cover crops in these very, very tall containers of soil. And that, on the left, the sorghum stands a little hard to see in the picture, but the roots go all the way to the bottom. Uh, radish can also send roots five to seven feet deep. Pearl milled is another one, uh, and there are others. So several things happen with uh, with this living roots throughout the soil profile is they contribute to both active organic matter and stable organic matter, both of which are vital for soil health and fertility. Uh, the fine roots uh, and the roots exudates uh, add to the active organic matter. And the, uh, some researchers have found that, in fact, when you look at stable soil organic matter, the majority of that was originally derived directly from plant roots that um, grew and then eventually died in the profile and became organic matter. Another thing is that these deep uh, root systems really do open up the soil profile, uh, re reduce hard pan, and uh, they actually pave the way for the next cash crop to grow deeper roots and thereby uh, have greater resilience to drought, greater access to moisture and nutrients. Another thing that deep-rooted crops do is they retrieve nutrients from the subsoil, and this can be important in two ways. One is if there's nitrate that's leached away from a shallower rooted or perhaps an over-fertilized crop, the deep-rooted heavy-feeding crops like uh, pearl millet and uh, radish and sorghum sedan 
they'll take up that nitrate and instead of it becoming a problem in the groundwater, it becomes a resource for the next crop or, or uh, for the future. And the other thing is there are other nutrients like such as potassium that exist in a mineral form throughout the soil profile. And if the topsoil is a little short of potassium, uh, these deep-rooted crops, especially the grasses, will mobilize that and return it to the surface. Next. The third principle is to build crop diversity for soil biodiversity. Each crop species has its own favorite set of microbes or own root zone microbiome that is most beneficial. And some of these crop these crops actually send chemical signals out that say, okay, I want this species of mycorrhizae. So it'll send out signals that wake up that particular set of organisms. And then, of course, the root exudates that come out will be the ones that will, will feed those organisms. And another thing, there have been some studies where you just take a, a crop rotation that's of low diversity, like corn soy or, or continuous corn or something like that, and adding just one cover crop or even one cash crop to that rotation has made significant differences in the diversity of the soil life and also the other parameters of soil health, like the ability to build and maintain organic matter. Another thing to remember about uh, cover crops is the grass and the legume species almost all of them are very strong hosts for mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, mycorrhizal fungi are highly beneficial and important to many crops, especially strawberries, um, allium family, any of the cash crops in the grass and legume families, tomato family, uh, not all the plant species. The, the crucifer family is non-mycorrhizal, but it's very good to maintain a high and diverse population of these fungi. So when you have that crop diversity, now you don't necessarily have to plant a five species or 15 species cover crop cocktail. You can design the, ro the uh, diversity through time uh, so that over the course of the rotation, you might use four different species of cover crops and have four different species from different plant families also in your cash crops. Okay, next. So the fourth principle of um, uh, soil health is to minimize soil disturbance. Now, in non-organic uh, con uh, conservation agriculture, which is like conventional ag best, best management practices, they do away with all physical disturbance. It's continuous no-till to the greatest extent practical. On the other hand, they allow uh, those systems do use um, judicious amounts of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, so there's some chemical disturbance. In the case of organic, it's the reverse. The national organic standards say no... Um, no synthetics, essentially, and to be careful with organic nutrient sources so you're not overloading and, and leaching. So organic approach is to pretty much do away with chemical disturbance and to accept a moderate degree of physical disturbance. And one thing to remember is that when you have a good organic uh, rotation, a good integrated system with a high um, degree of sustainable intensification, good cover crops, appropriate inputs, um, you can have some tillage and still be building organic matter and soil health to high levels, to higher levels than you can achieve in a, a continuous conventional no-till with, um, without cover crops or with inadequate cover crops. Next. So uh, here's some challenges and some resources to help you o overcome them. Uh, I probably won't spend a lot of time talking about the resources. They'll be listed on the slides for you to refer to later, and, and there'll be um, uh, links to the websites. Next. The first big challenge is selecting the cover crop, and this is a matching game because there are so many factors to consider. Uh, you will have to look at your site. What are your goals and priorities for the cover crop? Uh, like, what do you need? Uh, your climate, your frost dates, your rainfall patterns, uh, soil conditions. Um, and what the rotation niche is. You got a five week gap in the summer, or do you have a long winter gap? Um, are you harvesting early in the fall and then plan to try to get early in the spring again, in which case you have fall and winter, but you want to be ready to, to plant in the spring? Uh, and uh, your overall production system, what tools you have? Uh, do you have a roller crimper so that you can do a no till cover crop management or an undercutter, which is a minimum till uh, tool? Oh, are you are you currently relying on the moldboard plow and don't have the financial resources to invest in a new tool just yet? And then you want to look at the cover crop traits, plant family, growth habit, biomass, 
how, how the root architecture is, uh, of course, the seasonal life cycle and, and the cover crops frost tolerances, and whether it's um, strengths or nitrogen fixation or nutrient recovery, um, the carbon to nitrogen ratio that you can expect out of the cover crop or the mix, et cetera. And of course, the availability of seed is going to be an issue and the cost of it as well. So I will not be able to tell you what cover crop to grow. However, the resources that are arranged on a regional basis uh, should help you to do so. Next. So some additional cover crop challenges, poor stands. I've had these myself. I've had a real frustration in my own garden. Uh, here I am talking on these webinars to hundreds of people about soil health. And there's my garden bare and washing away because the cover crop didn't come up. Several possibilities could be a reason for those poor stands. Um, bad seed, that's the case in this example of a, a field trial of different soybean varieties. The one on the left, we happened to get good seed. We got a beautiful stand. You couldn't find a weed in there at all. On the right, it was a poor stand, and although the soybeans did fill in, and you could see quite a bit, you have a lot of weeds as well. Uh, you can have problems uh, with seed soil contact, either if the soil tilth is poor, and that just means you have to work on that soil health, or because if you're trying to plant the cover crop through a lot of residue, you need to have the right drill or planting technique to ensure that you have good seed soil contact. Getting the cover crop on too late or too low a seeding rate will also give you thin stands. Uh, cover crop termination, uh, terminating the cover crop in time to plant your cash crop without excessive tillage. Um, it can be a real challenge for organic growers. Now, I'm not saying that if you till in the cover crop, you're going to lose the whole game. That's not true. But if you have a cover crop and the only tools you have are a moldboard plow and a rototiller, and it's very thick and tall and stemmy, and you've got to really beat that soil to, to death to get a seed bed, you have a problem. And uh, that is a challenge that you might have to adjust when you terminate the cover crop, maybe look into new equipment, et cetera. Um, optimizing the nutrient release. One thing to remember is you have all legume or if you have a really succulent green manure like a radish cover crop that's still green and juicy and you know, the radish is yummy to eat and everything, but you turn that under um, or the all legume cover, you may release the nitrogen so fast that it'll leach away before your next cash crop can use it. This can even happen to some extent if you're planting field corn, which is one of the heaviest feeders out there. An all-grass cover crop or an over-mature mix, on the other hand, will have a high carbon nitrate ratio and can tie up some um, soil nitrogen. Next. So here's some nationwide information sources. Uh, cover cropping in an organic farming systems. There's a whole um, section on the e-organic uh, section of the extension website. Lots of great uh, video clips. And the SARI uh, uh, USDA uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education has a learning center and a cover crops topic room. And um, again, a, a plethora of great resources. Next. All right, so we'll start looking at uh, the regions one by one. The north central region, the leading cover crop challenge is that short growing season. The further north you get, the shorter that growing season and the tougher it is to fit a cover crop and a full season cash crop uh, into the same season. So very often farmers find themselves choosing, well, do I want to plant the cover crop late or terminate it early and end up with not that much biomass or, or, or nitrogen, or do I want to delay the planting of the cash crop and uh, risk some yield loss? Uh, another thing that can happen is if you try to use um, uh, a roll crimp uh, organic no-till system, the soil will stay so cool and wet under the rolled covers that this can interfere with either stand establishment or nitrogen uh, mineralization and therefore crop nutrition. A uh, couple of really interesting ways to meet this challenge, um, and there's been a lot of successful demonstrations and research with it. Um, first is to intercede or oversee the cover crop directly into the cash crop. I mentioned earlier that um, interceding uh, with and this can be done if you have uh, crops in a 30-inch row spacing like corn or soybean. There are now available special seeders that will plant a triple row of your cover crop between each successive cash rows right in that alley. And you can drive through an established crop that's maybe a foot high and just sow that cover crop 
and that could be at your last cultivation. You just, you know, the last cultivation for weed management. Uh, so the cover crops, so instead of growing more weeds late in the season, you're growing cover crop seedlings and they're ready to go. In the picture, this has been a cereal, this is a cereal grain crop. And depending upon the season and your locale and what type of uh, grain you're growing, you can either seed a legume, like a, a, a perennial red clover, right with the uh, grain, or you can overseed the grain or frost seed it like in March. You've got your established winter grain, uh, but it's still short. Go out there and scatter clover seeds, and it gets uh, going and, and starts to come up like you see in the picture um, before the grain is harvested. And then when it is harvested, the cover crop takes over. Another really interesting uh, technique for no-till cover crop uh, management where it's rolled down is to actually plant the cash crop before the cover crop is terminated. And uh, this is something that organic growers should try on a small scale first because when you don't have any herbicides available to deal with any weeds that might be coming up in this uh, situation, uh, this can be quite risky, but uh, it's certainly worth looking into. Uh, the SARI uh, cover crop survey show that more and more farmers um, are trying this technique. Basically, you seed your 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 cash crop directly into a standing cover crop. You need the, the, the right kind of planter that can work in no-till conditions. And then either just before or just at the time of uh, emergence, Take the roller through there. If the, if the soybean is, or corn is only you know half an inch out of the ground, the roller is not going to really damage it very much. And uh, then you get the um, cash crop emerging through the freshly rolled cover, and that saves time and that makes it more feasible in this short season. Okay, next. Here's some resources. Midwest Cover Crop Council. There is now a cover crop council for each of the major regions, uh, the Sarah regions. Uh, the western one is just getting established. Um, the southern and the northeast are um, early stage development, but the Midwest Cover Crop Council has been in existence for a number of years, and again, as a treasure trove of resources. I wanted to draw your attention to this video. It shows organic soybeans that were planted into planted green into rye, and which is then roll crimped as the soybeans emerged. And uh, you can you'll see in that video a beautiful stand and an excellent result. This is an organic application. Okay, next. Northeast, same deal. Short growing season, bitter cold winters. The first two pictures were taken in central Vermont, and this is uh, where uh, far, uh, farmer and author uh, Elliot Coleman was managing a one and a half acre uh, vegetable uh, farm for a, um, a private school. And on the left, he has planted soybeans, uh, forage soybeans, right between his rows of sweet corn. So the soybeans are going to winter kill, but look at all the biomass that's going back into the soil. He's not going to till that up this fall. He's going to let it all freeze down and come back early in the spring when the residues are dead and they're easy to manage and plant as the next crop. In the middle, uh, I took these pictures in October, so in the middle, the tomatoes are all along frozen out. And... He had taken a, a, a cedar, it was actually a push cedar, but uh, same idea as that uh, tractor mounted intercedar I mentioned earlier, and sown several rows of perennial red clover, which are now almost ready to just close canopy into the tomato rows and uh, give a cover crop. On the right, this is uh, actually from uh, the Appalachian region of Virginia, which has a climate about similar to New Jersey or um, southeastern Pennsylvania, so it's a little relevant to the Northeast. Uh, Dr. Ron Morris of Virginia Tech uh, has been developing the system where he makes the raised beds in the fall, plants rye and vetch, comes through again with a special uh, no-till planter, this time a potato planter. And he sets the potatoes right into the living rye and vetch when uh, the rye is just about on the boot stage. And what happens is the rye and vetch then grow up, and because potatoes take their time coming up, he can wait three or four weeks and then comes along and either mows or roll crimps that cover crop, the potatoes come up through it. The mulch keeps the soil cool and moist so that you have better potato yield. He said on average, compared to um, uh, an average 17% yield improvement in this system compared to organic potatoes grown where the cover crop is tilled in prior to planting. Next. 
some resources for the Northeast region. Um, they say the Northeast Cover Crop Council hasn't been around that long, but I'm pretty excited because they really have developed quite a bit of information on a state-by-state -state basis. They're planning their annual conference uh, this November at State College, Pennsylvania, and they provide guidance for, for farmers to do their own armed farm cover crop trials and have an internet active website where farmers can share their results and observations. And they do say a decision tool will be coming out this fall. Um, imagine it will be coming out in the fairly near future. Um, anyway, uh, Pennsylvania State University and Cornell University, um, they have also done a lot of excellent research on uh, cover cropping and organic systems. Uh, definitely worth looking up their extension websites as well. Next. In the south, the big challenge is the intense summer heat. So I'm focusing here on summer cover crops. Uh, you got sorghum sedan, sun hemp, um, indigo, and lab lab. I think I made a mistake that's not quite clockwise. The lab lab is lower left. Uh, oh, yeah, that is right. Excuse me. Uh, in any case, all of these cover crops share an incredible tolerance for high temperatures. If it's 95 degrees out, uh, you've actually... Uh, if your days are up in the high 90s, you are stressing crops like corn and soybeans. Uh, they'll still be able to produce, but you're getting some yield loss from it. And if you're trying to grow vegetables, it can be really tough to grow vegetables then. Uh, so a lot of uh, vegetable growers in the very hottest parts of the south will rotate their fields out of production during those hot months. And instead of just growing weeds or letting the soil wash away in thunderstorms, you grow cover crops like this. And... Uh, so you're building soil when it's too hot to grow crops. Next. So there is another challenge in the southern region. Our soils tend to be of low native fertility. You take a, you take a, a soil sample from the top soil, typically a sandy coastal plain soil, uh, you'll get low values of most of your nutrients in your soil organic matter, maybe like 1.2% and things like that. Another thing that some of these coastal plain soils have is they have a naturally compacted or compaction-prone horizon that's between what's called the A horizon or the top soil, which is biologically active, and the subsoil or B horizon, which is where any clays or nutrients that have leached from the surface tend to redeposit. This is a, a characteristic of the highly weathered soils or altosols in the uh, southeast. And... So the way I look at southern soils is it's not like they're not fertile. It's like that the two aspects of fertility, the biological activity and the um, nutrient, the mineral reserves, especially the cation nutrients and the clays that hold them, they're separated in space. And so I found that, you know, if you just do um, good design of your crop rotation with lots of deep-rooted cover crops, you can kind of bring those two aspects of the fertility back together and get pretty good production. Um, and then I was under uh, learned about these very uh, challenging soils in the in some of the coastal plain areas. I'm up in Appalachia where our altosols are pretty fertile uh, for that particular soil order. But in the uh, coastal plain, you have this very compacted E horizon. And um, I remember consulting for a couple of growers for that and thinking, oh my God, what a headache! How how can I tell them to really what will I tell them that's going to help? And I read a really interesting study by some researchers um, in coastal South Carolina, and the reference will be in the, in the uh, uh, notes that will be posted with the webinar later on. Um, they grow a winter where I cover crop, and this isn't even the most effective deep-rooting subsoil area. It's not quite like sorghum sedan or pearl milled or a tillage radish, but it was effective enough to allow a subsequent cotton crop to send its roots down through the E into the B, get more moisture, get more nutrients, and sustain higher yields. The only other way that farmers in that region could get a decent cotton yield is to deep rip, to really vigorously till, uh, do vertical tillage. So um, those deep-rooted crops, um, especially some of the ones on the previous slide, that, you know, like the millets and the, um, the, the tropical legumes, uh, they will really help with that hard pan issue and will we'll, uh, bring up more fertility. Next. Okay, here's some resources. Again, the Southern Cover Crop Council, um, they have some really good articles and resources, especially on planting and termination methods and tools and, and timing. Some really excellent um, 
information that will help you apply in detail and in practice what I'm kind of only able to cover in a general sense today. Um, and this resource will be expanded over the next couple of years. Uh, so uh, if it's not there, if it's not there for your particular part of the South yet, uh, just uh, check it again in a few months or next year, and hopefully there will be more available next. Okay, in the West, uh, this is the uh, region of, with which I have the least experience uh, because so many parts of the West have very limited moisture resources. And the challenge is that in the long run, growing cover crops rather than doing the traditional wheat fallow rotation, where you grow wheat once every two years and maintain a tilled or chemical bare fallow for the other 14 months of the rotation, Growing cover crops, or even growing a cash crop like a pulse, uh, which is a large, you know, like peas or beans, in that alternate year is going to build soil fertility, build soil health, and gradually increase the soil's moisture holding capacity. The flip side is that having grown a crop that in that off year, you've consumed some soil moisture. So it's a real challenging trade-off. Uh, Many studies uh, in different parts of the interior west have given different results. You could, uh, there are instances where the yield of the wheat after the cover crop was significantly hurt by that moisture consumption, cases in which the wheat yielded just as well, so you came out ahead on soil health and broke even on, nutri on uh, yield, and even some cases where, um, especially after several years of doing this cover cropping, the soil had improved so much that the wheat was actually doing better with the cover crop. So some uh, some uh, tips for meeting this challenge uh, is to use relatively shallow rooted and moisture efficient cover crops. Um, some cover crops are highly drought tolerant because they can do a lot of growth on not that much moisture. An example is uh, some of the uh, varieties of winter pea that are used frequently out there. On the other hand, some cover crops are drought resilient because they have huge, deep, extensive root systems and they really suck the soil moisture. They're, just, they're, they're heavy moisture users and they're very efficient at getting them. So um, you don't really want to grow one of those like alfalfa right ahead of your uh, wheat crop because the soil profile will be totally dry. Um, one way to get around the moisture consumption but without having your soil exposed and blowing away is at least leave the residue in place on in the summer. If there's a way you could mow off your cover crop at flowering in late spring ahead of a, a fall planting of winter wheat, uh, at least having that, that residue there is going to help. And I, I, this is an area that uh, I think more research is needed and more research is being done. Next. There are some great resources for the western region. There is a cover crop article on the uh, ATRA website, which is specific to Western regions. Um, and uh, there's another group just launching a Western Cover Crops Council. Uh, I've also found since I prepared this webinar that uh, both Montana State and Oregon State Extension Services have developed a lot of excellent nutrient management and cover crop information for the very many different uh, Subregions within the West, including some of the drier areas. Next. Uh, touch on the Terry cover crop surveys. These have been conducted every year since 2012. In a drought year, those who are using cover crops noted significantly better yields. Um, in years without drought, uh, on the average, um, based on surveys of over 1,000 farmers each year, some years over 2,000. There's been a slight upward trend in yield. There's only a few percent. Uh, however, farmer adoption of cover crop has been increasing year to year quite significantly, and it's because the farmers are seeing the benefits to soil health. And they're seeing some benefits in weed suppression, and they like the yield stability. They like knowing that because their soil is healthier, if they get under the bad drought year, they're not going to suffer as badly. And the latest survey, 65% of the f farmers planted uh, mixtures rather than just monocultures, 27 tried the interceding into the standing cash crops that I mentioned, and 39% have tried uh, the planting green, the seeding the cash crop. Now, these are not organ all organic farmers. Most of them are probably non-organic, uh, but it is showing this overall trend uh, 
towards cover crops benefiting yields or at least holding them steady uh, while greatly improving soil health. And as a result, this, uh, the use of cover crops is increasing. Okay, next. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about selecting and managing for specific uh, soil health uh, uh, objectives. So just getting started, the first step is just to add a cover crop during any uh, extended fallow season, winter or very hot summer or whatever. Um, and as I mentioned before, just adding one cover crop to your existing rotation can be highly beneficial. Um, and even a dead cover crop residue is good insurance against uh, having a, an erosion event, such a heavy rain, which you've seen lots of in the east this year. Um, and here's an example of a cover of a, a winter rye cover crop, and those are some of its strengths there uh, listed. Next, and this is an example for my. Uh, this is where I. This is actually in my own neighborhood. We have a little community garden. We dug potatoes in July, and one of my community mates, bless his heart, immediately that afternoon planted sorghum Sudan grass in that dug up potato field. And then come the end of September, we had this incredible rainstorm. I've never seen such rain in Floyd County in my life. Pushed the fence over, and when I came back, so it looked like somebody had roll crimped the cover crop, but we didn't lose any soil there. I mean, this was, um, this was just like a perfect demonstration of the importance of cover cropping. Next. So uh, if your goal is to protect the soil surface, what you want is that rapid establishment and canopy closure. And for the longer term, you want some persistent or high carbon residues. Uh, example is this foxtail millet and cowpea crop on the right. That's only 50 days, three days after planting. And you can see it solidly covered that field. If they had a hurricane rain there, that might flatten the crop, but the soil will stay put. Um, examples of of our buckwheat. Buckwheat is one of the fastest ones to cover the ground. Cowpea is excellent too and radish. Um, and then for the, uh, you want some grasses, cereal grains, um, um, or millets or sorghum sedan. And you can see from that previous example, the sorghum sedan is pretty good at covering the ground quickly in hot weather. Next. <clears throat> so if you're going to want to build soil organic matter, you want high biomass, you want that deep extensive root systems, and you want enough persistent residue um, that is not going to just break down real quickly. And you don't want a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio. You want a moderate ratio. Um, you mix some of these uh, high biomass grasses with some uh, legumes, you really get the best soil buildup. Uh, because that medium, that kind of balanced mix of carbon and nitrogen, that's what feeds the soil life most effectively. It uh, supports the best uh, soil biota. Next. And if you want to keep that top soil in really good tilth, you want an extensive fibrous root system uh, like this ryegrass here. Um, and again, if you have um, a little bit of legume or something else succulent in there, so there's some more readily available um, exudates, including amino acids and proteins, and you have a really well-nourished soil food web, then you're going to get that active organic matter that further promotes um, aggregation. Next. Breaking subsurface, a hard pan, opening the soil profile. I mentioned this earlier. Um, some of the winners in this category are radish, canola, alfalfa, which is, of course, a perennial. All, most of the clovers, uh, sweet clover has a really strong tap root. Um, pearl millet and sorghum sedan grass. Uh, there were studies on pearl millet that showed that even with a severe hard pan with a very low subsoil pH, which will stop most plant roots, the pearl mill went right through, got down to six, seven feet, and got down there so thoroughly that um, any spare nitrate was absorbed by that uh, pearl millet. Next. So feeding soil life, building diversity, again, that mix of high and low carbon to nitrogen, I mentioned that earlier, uh, include mycorrhizal host species um, and the high diversity. Here's a couple of um, high diversity mixes in, uh, for summer, spring and summer. Next. So as you got certain specific soil challenges, you can select cover crops to address them. On the way, you got a, on the left there in that picture, you had a, a, a wet soil, and you can see how the surface is kind of sealed over by the, having had standing water after some rains. 
And that yellow nut sedge, that's a weed that tends to um, come in in great numbers in wet soils. Um, there are a few cover crops that can tolerate that. Japanese millet, uh, oats are pretty good in the in the wet, and also alcite clover, which is a, um, a a perennial clover, a lot like red clover, but it's um, a little more tolerant of the wet conditions. If your soil is low fertility, most cover crops are fairly tolerant, but here's a few of the ones that I've seen perform really well on soil that was poor enough to stunt something like sorghum sedan grass or even uh, forage soybean. Uh, sun hemp, pearl millet, uh, cowpea, and buckwheat. Um, acidic soils, uh, uh, oats and rye, uh, vetch, cowpea, and sun hemp, and buckwheat, they all can tolerate down to about 5.5. So one thing you can do when you've got an acid soil, you see we're coming into a new field, and say, oh, the pH is only 5.2, and what am I going to do? Well, by all means, spread the lime, but in the meanwhile, start building the soil with one of these cover crops. They'll do fine. Um, and then if you have alkaline soil conditions, pH above 7.5, uh, barley and crucifers, and also uh, alfalfa and sweet clover, I should have mentioned, uh, will perform well in, in the moderate alkalinity. Next. So this has become all the rage and with good reason among researchers, among NRCS um, personnel, and also some of the most experienced farmers who have been using cover crop for a long time, mixing uh, 5, 10, 15 different species from at least three and perhaps five different plant families um, can give even greater uh, and more complete benefits to soil health. There's one grower, um, David Brandt in Ohio, uh, admittedly not organic, but he has really cut out most of his synthetic inputs because of the cover crops. Grows a 10 species mix for one year and the next year he can grow field corn with no added fertility. Uh, if if he, uh, he sees no response to nitrogen, he can grow it, and that's because the legumes fixed a lot of nitrogen and all the other cover crops uh, fostered a, uh, a very abundant and diverse soil biota, and the next year, all of that organic matter and biological activity fed the corn. But these are very, very complicated to handle. If you got a, you try to figure out planting 10 different species with 10 different seed sizes and shapes, so it's probably good to just start with a two-species mix of a legume and a grass. You get a really good balanced outcome. They balance the carbon and the nitrogen. And in the case of a cereal grain and something viney like peas or vetch, the architecture, the, the grain supports the legume. So if the vine isn't sprawling on the ground but it's growing up plants, you'll, it will actually make more biomass and stay healthier. Uh, and I've also seen a number of uh, trials where the, the biculture of a grass and legume suppress weeds more effectively than either one alone. Okay, next. Yeah. Okay, here's just an example of the grass legume. The rye and veg has been worked with by a lot of uh, researchers and farmers use it a lot. Um, when you want to optimize nutrient management, the neat thing about having a grass and a legume is that if your soil nitrogen happens to be low, the legumes are going to fix more nitrogen. If your soil nitrogen is already high, the grass will dominate and will soak up that nitrogen and conserve it and keep it in the topsoil and in the plant biomass. Another thing is that legumes are very good at making phosphorus more available when the soil test phosphorus is low. And the grasses, on the other hand, are really good at retrieving uh, mineral fixed potassium in situations where the exchangeable potassium is low. So this mixture is just a really good general uh, nutrient management tool. Next. Weed management, um, you just want to get the ground covered. Uh, iron and clay cowpea on that left, that was actually planted in an area where uh, poor weed management resulted in most of the cover crops of the trial being weedy. But the iron clay cowpea stood out as an exception. There's hardly any weeds in that stand. And on the right, you can see again the example of where you have oats and bell beans. They're going to shade the ground more effectively than either crop alone. And that rapid early growth and the and uh, aggressive competition for nutrients are also really good weed fighting ha uh, uh, traits. Next. So uh, uh, pest management won't spend a lot of time in this, but if that's, those are goals to think of, um, if you want natural enemies of uh, plant pests, you want shallow, small uh, flowers that are rich in nectar and or pollen. This is a buckwheat is an exa excellent example. Here's a very highly beneficial uh, soldier beetle whose larvae eat pests 
while the adults are hanging out in the flowers. Um, a number of uh, other uh, good uh, pollen and uh, uh, nectar plants are phacelia, vetches, uh, mustards, uh, sunflowers. Uh, cowpeas have extra floral nectaries. And low growing covers provide ground cover for things like ground beetles, which are good generalist predators. Next. So managing pests and disease through rotation. This is an excellent manual published through uh, SARE um, and uh, through the uh, Cornell uh, research, in, uh, research Station. And the goal here is to disrupt lab cycles of pests and pathogens. And if you have a particular uh, plant feeding nematode, a pest nematode, you want to look for cover crop varieties and uh, species and varieties that suppress or at least do not host that particular nematode. Uh, next. So a few planning tips. Timing, timely establishment is, is, is vital. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I planted too late in this garden, it, it, the soil stayed bare and it washed a little bit. And um, using compost or manure uh, ahead of the cover crop, like if you have a soil that's got showing low in phosphorus and potassium and it's just tired, you really need to get it re, re, uh, regenerated. A really good way is to spread a few tons per acre of manure and plant a cover crop because if the soil is really low fertility, the cover crop itself will grow, but it won't grow the biomass that you need to really build soil health. Um, if you're planting late or if the field is weedy, you can increase your seeding rates by 50 to 100 percent. I wouldn't go much above 100 percent in most circumstances because you can see too thick and the plants compete so severely with each other that they're all sickly. You don't get as good a biomass. Uh, and when you're planting a grass with a legume, if you want the legume to have a fighting chance, cut your grass rate by half or sometimes more. Um, if you're doing a cocktail with three or more species, a good starting point is just to take your sole seeding rates and divide each one by the number of species and then see what happens. And if you see which ones tend to dominate, which ones tend to uh, get choked out, then you can adjust your rates the next year. Planting technique is really important. If you're going to um, uh, no-till drill or planter is really important for high residue situations. And if you have the means to irrigate a cover crop um, and your soil is dry when you plant, it certainly makes sense to do one irrigation just to get it up. And once it's up, it'll probably be able to fend for itself. Next. Here's a good example of uh, what I consider really excellent uh, uh, planting technique. This is a, a farmer out on the, in the uh, Tidewater region of Virginia, one of those coastal sandy loams that I was mentioning. He actually has gotten very skilled with that little hand spinner, a $30, $40 implement that you just strap around yourself and go out there and turn a crank and throws the seeds out. He plants the rye and vetch at 50 plus 25, and that's a very economical seeding rate. And now he has that rototiller rigged so that it will only work an inch deep. So any seed weeds that have come up in that field get knocked out and the seeds get planted. And then over on the right, uh, there's a seed a field that was planted four days previous and one that was planted 11 days previous. You can see the excellent stands that resulted. Next. Terminating cover crops. Um, again, I mentioned this is a big challenge for organic growers. Uh, if you are, especially if you're in the southern half of the country and you have the proper equipment, uh, it may be worth experimenting with rotational no-till where you terminate the cover crop without tillage, uh, best with a roller crimper or perhaps with a flail mower or an undercutter, which actually is, tills a little bit, but very shallowly. Um, if you're further north, um, you may want to be very cautious about attempting organic no-till because of the challenges with cool soil and nitrogen tie-up or failure to mineralize nitrogen, et cetera, or try it on a small scale. Uh, one tip is that um, a number of, of, of um, studies have shown that with soybean, which it fixes its own nitrogen, uh, it does quite well in organic no-till in the central part of the country uh, because the rye, a roll crimped rye crop, will really suppress the heavy nitrogen responder weeds, things like pig weeds and foxtails and lambs quarters that will would otherwise choke out the crop. And with that rye there and with the soybean fixing its own nitrogen, you've basically given the soybean a, a, a head start. 
However, and that may work for some other uh, strong nitrogen fixers, uh, but setting that aside, there's some other ways to work with terminating the cover crop without having to till the soil excessively. Uh, spading machine, uh, a number of growers I've talked to said, if you just you know just mow down your cover crop, you can spade in a really heavy cover crop and get a decent seed bed. Now you may need a, a finishing pass with a you know a shallow till with a rototiller for fine seeded crops, but for transplanting or large seeded or you know, things like potatoes, the spading machine may leave a good enough seed bed. Uh, moldboard plow, of course, is a standard way. If you do it, be sure not to set it so deep you're bringing up the uh, subsoil or beef horizon. Uh, mowing by followed by shallow non-inversion tillage is, is uh, I think, is a pretty good way to do it without having excessive soil disturbance. You see that in the picture. Uh, sweet plow undercutter, I mentioned that earlier. Some studies out in uh, Nebraska showed that it gives much better uh, soil results and better yields than uh, uh, disking in the cover crop. In some circumstances, you could plant a cover crop in the early fall, picking varieties that will not overwinter, that are not hardy to your region, and let them winter kill. And then you have a dead residue that has protected the soil surface, and you have the roots decaying undisturbed in the soil profile. And then with very shallow tillage or maybe just row cleaners, you can go ahead and plant in the spring. Okay, and that's it. This is, these are our uh, these are some of our soil uh, health and organic farming guides that are available through Organic Farming Research Foundation. Um, just go on uh, www.ofrf.org and you can download them for free. Um, I'm not sure, but I believe there's a way to order hard copies as well. Okay, I think we're ready for questions. Is that right? Next. Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to start about a 30-minute question and answer period. So um, we have a number of questions in the queue, and we have a lot of them from one person. So I'll try to give more than one person a chance, but it's great to have all these questions. So um, I guess the um, first question is, how long does it take to build up soil organic matter with cover crops? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the first thing that will happen is your active organic matter and your soil biological activity are going to improve noticeably. Now, these are parameters that are not easy to measure through standard um, soil tests or through field tests, but uh, research has shown that within the first year or two, you get an increase um, in uh, soil health as measured by biological activity, nutrient cycling, and active organic matter. The total organic matter uh, may take anywhere from three to 10 years to show a really noticeable increase um, because you really, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not that exact a number to begin with and you're looking for really large changes before you can detect it. So, um, in fact, there was one study I heard that uh, Dr. Ray Weil, a, soil, a world-class soil scientist at University of Maryland, he cited a case on the eastern shore of uh, Virginia, which has very sandy soils, where the, the uh, farmer was getting poor yields, and the soil organic was 1.0. And uh, so Ray uh, had him start growing wine vetch cover crops and add some compost and just do basic uh, good soil organic management. And within a few years, the soil total organic matter inched up only to 1.2, but the measures of active organic matter went way up, and his spinach yields actually were tenfold higher. And this is not with main lining fertilizer to it. This was with organic methods. So that shows that you can get tremendous soil health benefits even before your soil test loss on ignition organic matter goes up noticeably. Okay, great. Um, have there been any studies or anecdotal experience that shows that the use of cover crops to improve soil health reduces the amount of necessary fertilizers in the following year for people that use fertilizers? Um, does it save money? Does it cut costs or run off? Yeah, I, do. I think a lot of studies have, have uh, shown that uh, because you have more biological activity, um, and you're, you're re recycling the nutrients. Certainly if you're growing a legume or if you've been growing a legume grass combination. Uh, now, when you terminate the cover crop, if it's uh, soil, if it's um, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio is 20 or less, it will release nitrogen directly to your next crop. 
And if it's higher than, say, 30, it will temporarily tie up nitrogen. Uh, but also, uh, even with phosphorus and potassium, uh, in good organic uh, systems, well-managed organic systems with cover crops, he found that, that the crops don't even need you to add potassium and phosphorus, and a lot of the nitrogen has been brought in through the cover crop. Now, the healthier, soil, healthier your soil gets over time, the more nutrients you're going to get from organic matter itself. The soil life is constantly breaking down organic matter and releasing nutrients, especially nitrogen, but also other nutrients. So um, there have been a lot of studies that indicate that uh, certainly in the long run, and sometimes also in the short run when you're dealing with a legume, you will get um, a, a capacity, your ability to reduce fertilizer inputs. It's a well-known well benefit of cover crops. Okay. Um, what cover crops would you advise when wireworms or nematodes are present? Um, and here's an example, I guess, of a nematode that this person has, um, Pratolinchus penetrant. Uh, well, I would refer uh, this person to the uh, Cornell Seri Guide on uh, Crop Rotations. It has an extensive table in the back showing what cover crops may suppress certain nematodes. I don't know, I'm not a nematologist, I don't recognize the name. Um, so I can't really answer that one in detail, but I, could, I can say that it's very likely that there will be a cover crop that will at least be a non-host for that particular uh, nematode. Now, wireworm is the larva of a, uh, an insect called a uh, click beetle. And unfortunately, there are a few pests that will tend to increase when you have a lot of fresh residue in the soil. So this may be a, ma a matter of managing the cover crop a little differently. Um, it's possible if you're getting a lot of wireworm with, with turning under the cover crop, you might try a no-till or an undercut uh, termination or winter kill where you just have the roots breaking down um, undisturbed in the soil profile. That may not have as great a tendency to, to encourage these pests. There are a few cover crops that will support certain nematodes, like root knot nematode, likes clovers and likes tomatoes. So if you have a lot of that particular type of nematode, you don't want to have clover ahead of your tomato in the rotation. Okay. Um, this person is interested in whether um, one of the resources that you mentioned, or if you know of a resource that teaches companion cover crops and food crops. Like grown together? Well, I guess which ones might be compatible? Um, again, I would go to that. Uh, I would go to that uh, rotation manual. Like, give some of that information. One pattern, uh, one specific example that has emerged uh, is that when you grow spinach after a crucifer cover crop, especially radish, you grow plant radish in the late summer, let it winter kill, and I've seen this myself. I've never been able to grow spinach to save my life in the spring. I always get terrible stands. And this one time I was doing an experiment with Dr. Ron Morse at Virginia Tech and planted spinach and said, well, we'll see if anything comes up. But I go out there, wherever there was radish, whether it was tilted or not, there was a beautiful stand of spinach. And the thing is, radish and spinach are both non-mycorrhizal. So the fact that the radish tends to actually suppress mycorrhizae, which all the crucifers do to some extent, spinach doesn't care. And the thing is, the radish is also antifungal in general, so why I think I was losing a lot of my stand to damping off, and so the radish wiped out a lot of the damping off fungi. It also suppressed the weeds pretty effectively, and boy, did we get good spinach stands. <laughs> so that, and then it, uh, Ray Weil and his students discovered uh, thought that, and you know, I used to think, well, wow, radish is almost like nature's paraquat. I mean, there's no weeds after it. And how do I get any vegetable production after it, much less an increase? And it turns out it's not really allelopathic. The dense canopy of a fall radish crop makes the weed seeds dormant. The radish exudates suppress uh, pathogenic soil fungi and maybe suppress mycorrhizae a little bit. Uh, but um, then the spinach is then able to come up without the damping off. Another one that I've read in the literature is that rye and vetch cover crops release some kind of chemical signals that 
uh, the following tomato crop, there's a shift in genetic expression so that the tomato is less subject to disease or early senescence. So that's a really good sequence. I mean, these are a few specifics, and I'm sure there's a lot more out there yet to be discovered, and there may well be either scientific or anecdotal evidence of many more examples. Okay. Um, is there a good non-invasive plant for the West Coast that um, one can use solely for the purpose of row walking paths? Uh, walking paths. Okay. Um, I don't know very much about West Coast, but I do know that um, here in the East, there are two uh, low-growing cover crops. Uh, one is uh, Dutch white clover, which, you know, it only needs to be mowed a few times a year. It doesn't get very tall. Um, another one is something called, I think it's called Companion. I don't know if it's still available. It's a mixture of dwarf perennial ryegrass and creeping red fescue. And there are low-growing grasses that, again, don't need a lot of maintenance. Now, you probably won't be able to use them in paths in, a stri in, a, in an organic no-till situation. You will have to till periodically uh, because there will be a slight tendency to invade into the beds. Uh, but if you are working the soil some, you can definitely keep that in check. Um, the West Coast, um, I don't know if these would work there or not. Um, I have heard there are a certain uh, relatives of alfalfa called medics, like black medic, uh, which tend to be shallow rooted and therefore don't deplete the soil profile of moisture, and yet they're fairly drought tolerant. Okay. Um, this person says, we try to interplant cover crops between maize rows and then mulch them when they start to compete with the corn. What cover crops might you recommend for this, um, providing enough weed suppression and uh, standing the corn shading? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Well, actually, cow pea is fairly tolerant of uh, corn shading, but it will winter kill. Now, red clover um, is exceedingly tolerant of uh, shading. It's one of the most shade tolerant crops out there. In fact, it can even be seeded into winter squash and let the winter squash grow all over it, and it doesn't grow much, but it stays, um, it hangs out there, and then it comes on after the winter squash vines are killed by fall frost or disease or, or are mowed off. Um, I know they've been doing, uh, that That there's been success with several different um, interseeds. Uh, vetch have been, has been interseeded. Um, I think ryegrass, uh, Italian ryegrass, which is a, a pretty much an annual um, I would say you just, have to, you just have to try different things um, and see which one works the best. Okay, here's an interesting history question. Um, do you know research estimates of the organic matter levels when the English first showed up in North America? Because now in Virginia and North Carolina, it's on the order of 1%. Um, do you know what it was like before? In Virginia and North Carolina, that is a really good question. Um, you can go to some old growth forests and take some cores, which you'll probably find is at the top. I mean, we are we are in a region that was originally forest, and um, the Native uh, Americans, the indigenous people, were actually managing those forests to produce a lot of mass. So they really favored chestnuts and oaks and things like that that produced edible nuts. Uh, but in any case, that is going to give you a very different soil profile than uh, any kind of tilled. Um, system. I really don't know what the historical native um, organic matter levels were uh, in this region. I mean, there are a few parts of Virginia that are actually tall grass prairie rather than forest, and uh, I'll go into one of those pastures and test it. I would say that you could pretty much, you know, without having to overload the soil with compost, which is one way to get your soil organic matter really high, but you get your nutrients out of balance too, and it's not really financially feasible on a on a large multi-acre farm. Uh, but with good cover crops and good organic management, very often you can inch that organic matter up to maybe 2 or 3%, and it depends upon the soil texture too. Um, the sandy loam, you get it up to one and a half or two, you're doing really well. Uh, if you're on one of our uh, Appalachian loams, you can usually get it up to four or five percent. I've seen a lot in that range, um, just with good basic management. Okay. Um, 
Okay, we have a question. I'd like to reduce weeds between rows of blackberries in coastal central California. I don't want the cover crop, for example, rye, growing among the berry plants. Can you seed cover crop seeds like clover or cowpea under a thick layer of compost, um, no-till? 